Today we go back to uh, Bronislav Malinovsky and Argonauts of the Western Pacific. Uh, and so we're going to look today at his uh, chapter on the, as he says, the essentials of the Kula. And what I want to keep in mind here is how he's, he's doing uh, two things, really. One is he's giving an example of what it looks like to do ethnography in the manner in which he's described it, where the ethnographer's task is to uh, get the, the, as he would put it, the native's perspective, but to be able to take, uh, to take everything that his informants give him and sketch a broader picture than they themselves would present for any given sort of social institution. The second thing is to take note of how uh, Malinovsky here is exemplary of the uh, functionalist approach that Durkheim um, is credited with generating. So he describes the Kula as a form of exchange involving two items, and there are only two items in the Kula. Neither one has economic value, and they're exchanged in a strict pattern across vast distances. So the items are these, uh, I'm not going to try and uh, attempt the, um, the, the proper uh, names for these, but uh, we'll use the necklaces and bracelets. These are the two items that circulate in this fixed pattern between partners in the exchange, the necklaces moving clockwise and the bracelets moving counterclockwise. Now, what does that mean? It means that among these islands, you can see here the Trobriand Islands, the Woodlark Islands, and so forth, the uh, bracelets and the necklaces move in opposite directions among the, among the islands carried by the, uh, the partners who are engaged in this exchange. To get a sense of the scale then, of the distances they covered, you can see off the uh, sort of north of Australia and to the east of Papua New Guinea, you can see the body of ocean they would cover. And to give you, again, a slightly closer view, uh, this is um, more or less the area that they would cover. And they would do this sailing across the oceans in uh, handmade canoes of the sort that you see here. You can't quite make out, but they're they're very um, deeply and ornately carved. So again, there's a sense here that the the way that the kula is carried out is not a simple instrumental activity, but is something that has uh, a ceremonial and um, sort of ritualistic quality to it. So then the, the whole exchange of these necklaces and bracelets is tightly regulated by traditions and conventions, um, but the, the point is not as it would be with something like wealth to gather together and amass these articles, but rather the point is to perpetuate the exchange, to keep it moving between the participants in these different islands. So uh, no man, and it's men who are engaged in this exchange, no man keeps an item, a necklace or a bracelet, for very long. The point is to have it, but then to pass it along to another partner. And... Uh, well, I'll get into later on. I'll get into how how it is that you're always going to be obligated to have more than one partner. So importantly, 
the nature of gifting in the kula is that it's ongoing. It's not, so it's not the case that you can exchange once and that's it. No, the, it's that it's perpetual. So then once a man makes an exchange, he and his partner are locked into a lifelong partnership of exchange. What you're establishing then is not just uh, the movement of material goods between people, that's what happens on the surface, but in fact, what you're really establishing is a relationship, a lifelong relationship with all of the commitments that uh, gifting entails. And we, we can see this in our own communities as well, of course, that uh, if someone gives you a gift, you feel a certain obligation to give something back to them in return at some future point. Um, and the way that the, the timing of that is set up is fairly important. So if, if you've received a birthday gift, for example, the obligation will probably be that you give that person a gift in return on his or her birthday. If it's um, something like, uh, if you're the kind who sends Christmas cards to people, if you got one from someone last year, then you probably feel a greater sense of obligation to send one to, to in return to those people this year than if you you would if you hadn't received one. Uh, so things like this, so that we can see in our own society that the timing of of returning gifts is very important, and that when you receive a gift, you're not simply receiving the thing; you're also receiving an obligation that you have to see to down the road at some at some point that's more or less fixed. The Kula then seems costly. Uh, it's a lot of work to make the ships, uh, especially to make them in such intricate detail. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of work to sail them over these long distances. It takes a lot of expertise to learn how to uh, cover these oceanic expanses. It's risky because you're covering these huge distances in canoes. Um, and yet, the kula itself doesn't produce any economic reward. The necklaces and bracelets are not monetary in value. You can't exchange them for other, for other things other than each other. Uh, so that you can't use them as currency. They're not economically useful for any purpose. They, they don't have any functionality, that is, uh, the way that, uh, say, I don't know, uh, bartering a, a bow and arrow for a shovel would, would be because both of these things is useful beyond the exchange beyond the function of gaining the opposite thing that you're trying to get beyond just the point of acquiring the thing that you want to get in a barter. Uh, and, and so it seems paradoxical. It would be cheaper and, and safer just to stay home. You wouldn't lose anything materially. And in fact, if you think about it in terms sort of, of Darwinian reproduction, um, Darwinian reproduction. If you think about it in terms of reproduction on a Darwinian model, that's a better way of saying that. Then the um, your chances of reproducing, of having children of your own, are comparatively better than those who go off and cross the seas in the Kula. Uh, partly because they'll be gone for extended periods, and partly because some of them won't make it back because it's dangerous. So on all of these different levels, it seems like the exchange itself is not adequate to explain why people would feel motivated to do this. And they clearly feel motivated. Uh, in Malinowski's depiction, 
they seem motivated to do this more than they seem motivated to do just about anything else. There's there's hardly a thing within the uh, the the life of the Torbriand Islanders that is more exciting to them that generates more uh, talk, more festivity. So why then engage in it? It seems very curious indeed. Well, in part, it may be because um, alongside the Kula, there, so alongside the exchange of the necklace and the bracelets, there's also a, actually a fair bit of economic trade. It's not governed in the same way as the Kula. It's, uh, it can be much more calculating. It can be, um, there, there can be open bartering over what is worth what in terms of trade. Uh, you're not as constrained to trade only with particular individuals and not others. Uh, the, the things that you are allowed to exchange, it, it's, it's a vast range. So then, um, this could be an explanation that the Kula facilitates this kind of economic exchange. Uh, but that would also leave open the question, so why bother with the Kula then? If the real purpose is the economic exchange, why not just go take the things that are unique to your island or your area that are absent in other areas, take those things because they'll be highly valued, trade them and then carry on, carry on gathering the things that you don't have in your island and bring them back. And why not just engage in that economic exchange? So that's not an entirely satisfying answer that the, the Kula simply facilitates this economic exchange. Okay, so then there are other activities that run parallel to the Kula or that are an anticipatory. Creating the canoes, for example. Um, engaging in the magic rituals that, uh, that, will, uh, that, that are done in order to secure a safe and profitable journey, what have you. But Malinovsky gives us another clue, saying, with a G, that the Kula, quote, welds together a considerable number of tribes, and it embraces a vast complex of activities interconnected and playing into one another. Now we start to see another dimension to the Kula. And again, this is one that Malinovsky would not necessarily find any of his, his contacts, any of his interlocutors saying, oh, well, we do this because it welds communities together. No, they'll say, we do this because we want to exchange the necklaces for the bracelets. We want to have, we want to bring back really fine, um, if they're going out with bracelets, we want to bring back really fine necklaces so that we can, uh, tell our fellow villagers the story about these necklaces and, and how we got them and the story of our travels. Uh, he then is saying that we can also see that there's another sort of level of functionality involved, and that is this welding together of tribes that are dispersed throughout all of these islands, separated by expanses of ocean, weaving them together and interconnecting them. The binding together then of these distant tribes into an organic whole, as he puts it, uh, is something that economic exchange might not be able to accomplish on its own. And you can, you can imagine why, right? That if you're just engaging in economic exchange, what you seek is probably the best deal that you can get. And if that's the case, then the person with whom you're exchanging is not necessarily someone to whom you feel bound, but it might be someone who you look at as something more like a competitor, because that person is also trying to get the best possible deal from you, trying to find an angle where he or she can get as 
um, beneficial a deal for him or for her and as poor a deal for you as possible. So then economic relationships might not be enough to build this organic whole that Malinowski talks about. He makes the point, though, that the Kula can perform its functions in spite of the fact that no individual per participants can provide a total outline of the collective social institution in which they participate. Now, I've made in a previous lecture a comparison on this count with language, that if I or any, any other English speaker were to try and give an account of English as a whole to a non-English speaker, well, pretty soon I or another person would discover the limits of what we know and what we can describe about the language. That there will be aspects of our language, say uh, some grammatical rules, that I won't be able to describe. Perhaps it's because I won't be aware of them. Uh, perhaps it's because although I use them, I find it difficult to uh, articulate what they are because I have only a vague sense of how I, how I apply these grammatical rules. And, uh, and, and it's not something that I've had to learn as a set of rules. So then you can see the same kind of thing at work here, that the participants in the Kula will understand how it functions. It, they'll understand perfectly well what's required of them to participate in it. Uh, they'll understand uh, what sorts of social relations are involved in it, what the exchange entails, but they might not actually be able to give this sort of comprehensive, all-encompassing account of what the Kula is. It's not necessary for them to be able to do that. And this is, again, why Malinowski feels that there's a role here for the ethnographer. It's the ethnographer's job to take the uh, disparate accounts of different participants and through that get the full picture. So then the Kula, or any other social institution for that matter, actually doesn't depend on the ability of any individual to have this comprehensive understanding of it in order for it to function. They need simply to know how to get by in the same way that I don't need to know every word in the English language in order to be able to use it. I only need to know the words that are important for me to um, carry on in my, in my native tongue. In Malinowski's view, it's the task then of the ethnographer to construct this picture of the Kula. On this front, he thinks the economic views of his day, uh, stressing impersonal, unceremonial, spontaneous exchanges of useful articles, this view that I was sort of sketching uh, a couple of slides ago when I was saying that a purely economic account just doesn't seem to do the work necessary to explain why people engage in the Kula, uh, he says, by contrast, and this is this whole long passage is a quote, the Kula is rooted in myth, backed by traditional law, and surrounded with magical rites. All its main transactions are public and ceremonial, carried out according to definite rules. It is not done spur of the moment, but happens periodically, at dates settled in advance, and it is carried out along definite trade routes, which must lead to fixed, fixed trysting places. The partnership is a lifelong relationship. It implies very mutual, various mutual duties and privileges, and constitutes a type of intertribal relationship on an enormous scale. As to the economic mechanism of their transactions, this is based on a specific form of credit which implies a high degree of mutual trust. Finally, the Kula is not done under stress of any need since its main aim is to exchange articles which are of no practical use. 
He points out that these articles, which appear more ornamental in nature, are in fact not generally worn. So they don't even really form the function of jewelry. They, they might, the, the possessor of them might wear them on particular kinds of festive occasions, uh, but in general, not even for that. They're, they're for display then, but not, not to be worn as accoutrement. Why then, he asks, are they valued at all? much less valued as highly as they are. Well, he compares them to the crown jewels. So we can see uh, on the right, in the darker photo, Sweden's crown jewels, and below the crown jewels of uh, the current Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, uh, of the UK, I should say. The keeper of the UK's crown jewels he recounts when he, he went to see them in Edinburgh, told him stories about when such and such royal wore them on this or that occasion. And he heard in this an echo of how the Trobriand Islanders would talk about Kula items. So this historic sentimentalism, as he refers to it, appears in both cases around these um, highly valued but economically valueless objects. That's where they get their value then, is this historic sentimentalism. The main point then is that both the European and in the New Guinean case as well, the articles are principally ceremonial so that the value they have as ceremonial objects in turn relates to how they are exchanged and by whom. So in, in this case, the crown jewels are different. They're not exchanged, they don't circulate, they remain the um, exclusive possession of the monarchy. So the comparison only holds so far. Uh, but you can get still the idea that he's pointing toward that these are ceremonial objects and their value comes from their ceremonial status. So then, uh, the point then, that their value comes from uh, how they're exchanged and by whom. So exchange occurs only between partners, according to specific formalities, and those with greater rank will have more exchange partners. <clears throat> exchange partners also take on mutual duties and obligations. He says, the Kula partnership is one of the special bonds which unite two men into one of the standing relations of mutual exchange of gifts and services so characteristic of these natives. And we'll see in a moment the kinds of obligations that this imposes upon the exchanging partners. Um, so when... when uh, a partner of yours in the Kula sails up and lands on the beach at your village on your island, your obligation is to act as a host to that individual, behave as a patron, and act as an ally. The sorts of things from which your visiting partner will need protection may be other islanders, but uh, the principal fear that many of them have at the time that Malinowski was writing was uh, against the kind of sorcery that would occur in your village that differs from the kind of sorcery or magic that would occur in the village of, uh, of your partner who has now sailed to, to see you and to engage in exchange. So then... The idea is that the, the visitor, your partner, won't have the necessary protections against the kind of sorcery and magic that appears in your village. And that's where you step in, that you're able to provide that kind of security, that kind of protection against the, so to speak, uh, sorcery native to your village, to your island, to your people, to your community. So then the Kula relationships provide partners with allies 
wherever they meet for exchange. And of course, this would be reciprocated when you sailed to their island in order to engage in the Kula exchange. So then the picture that we get from this is that the Kula constitutes this vast network of relationships binding together men separated by expanses of ocean and binding together their communities by extension. Right, that, that you can see that if not for this kind of exchange, there would be no good reason at all for alliances to form between the communities on these different widely distributed islands. And so this is a way that they do form alliances and they're highly structured, um, lifelong, enduring, deeply committed alliances. Now, along with Kula articles, the men bring non-ceremonial items as well. They, they might be little gifts that they can give to one another. Uh, they might be items that they can barter. Um, but Malinowski notes that this kind of economic item is not the only thing that's exchanged. He says, It's easy to see that in the long run, not only objects of material culture, but also customs, songs, uh, are uh, motives and... Um, and motives and uh, general influences travel along the Kula route. It is a vast intertribal net of relationships, a big institution constituting thousands of men, all bound together by one common passion for Kula exchange, and secondarily, by many minor ties and interests. So that, again, the idea here is that along with these alliances, you get something like cultural interchange. And as a result of that, the different communities are able to exert influence on their trading partners and their trading partners on them. So that there's this huge interchange, not just of the material items, but of all of these kind of intangibles as well that are the, uh, to pick a metaphor, the, that are the brick and mortar of everyday life of your home village. So then ultimately the circuit of exchange has a man giving necklaces and receiving bracelets in one direction and trading bracelets and necklaces in the other. This implies that all participants in the Kula must have at least two partners, which makes sense, right? You think if you, if you go out with necklaces, you're going out in this one direction to make exchanges with all your partners, what are you getting? You're getting bracelets in return. Now, the only way that you're going to be able to continue trading is to pass on these bracelets at, the, at some point. So they need to circulate in the opposite direction from the direction that you're going, hence the clockwise, counterclockwise direction of the two goods. And that clearly means you're going to have to have more than one trading partner. You're going to have to have somebody with whom you can trade the bracelets just as you are trading the necklaces. And again, this, this gives, I think, a sense of why these networks are so extensive and why it knits them together, the exchange knits them together into these definite relationships, definite alliances. Now, although the recipient of an item may not possess it for very long, in fact, there's pressure not to hang on to uh, even, even the finest of these items. He draws prestige from the article, from the stories he's able to tell about it, who's had it, who he plans to pass it on to, how it came into his possession. So all of the kind of legend and mythology that's built up around this object. This is how Malinowski explains it. Though held only in trust, only for a period, though never used in any utilitarian way, yet the holders get from them a special type of pleasure by the mere fact of owning them, of being entitled to them. 
we learn then that there's nothing of intrinsic value in the material of the article, of its utilitarian properties, which amount essentially to nothing, that give these articles value, or um, there's nothing intrinsic to them that allows them to give pleasure to the holder, but rather it is the social arrangements surrounding the item and its circulation that lets it confer prestige and pleasure. So Malinowski thinks that it's something like uh, a trophy that uh, a, a team, so I have here the, the Stanley Cup because I'm Canadian, so therefore I'm obligated to put up something about hockey. It's a passport thing. You, your team wins the trophy. You hold it for a fixed period. It gives you a certain kind of glory. You're able, again, to look back, in this case, literally on the surface of the trophy to see who has held it before, to recall the stories around the different teams that have held it before and how you came to hold it this time. But there's a limit on that. At a, a fixed point, it's going to pass on to the next team that that wins, that wins the the uh, the finals, that wins the Stanley Cup. So then, hopefully, you can see how these things are comparable. That there's a, a great deal of uh, glory associated with holding, especially a particularly fine item but that it's temporary. You're going to have to pass that one along. Now, there's a further dimension to the pleasure of obtaining a good article. And that is the recipient gets enjoyment not just from being in possession of an item with all of these great stories that attach to it, but from the feeling and the perception that it reflects something about him, his personal power that he was able to obtain this object the magic he was able to muster and deploy so that he could be the one to come into possession of this fantastic example of a necklace or a bracelet with all of the um, accumulated legend around it. So then, in some way, this thing and his, his possession of this thing is a reflection of something about him that's especially great as well. And it's not just that he holds a great object, right? So that there's this sense that um, in some way he stands to deserve to hold this object. And so that that says something not just about the object, but about him as an individual. Just as the pleasure and prestige of the Kula uh, articles comes from their social circumstances, not from their intrinsic properties, but the social circumstances surrounding them, those very same social circumstances impose on the participants certain constraints with respect to the tempo and decorum of exchanges. So Malinowski says, the main principle underlying the regulations of actual exchange is that the kula consists in the bestowing of a ceremonial gift, which has to be repaid by an equivalent counter gift after a lapse of time, be it a few hours or even minutes, though sometimes as much as a year or more may elapse between payments. But it can never be exchanged from hand to hand with the equivalence between the two objects discussed, bargained about, and com computed, right? So not like an economic barter. The decorum of the Kula, exchange, uh, the Kula transaction is strictly kept and highly valued. Connected to these concerns about the timing and the decorum of the exchange is the principle that the equivalence of counter gifts can never be imposed coercively, right? So that nobody can demand of you as the giver a certain gift in exchange. It always has to be up to the judgment of the giver what he's going to give and what the value of the thing that he's going to give will be. 
It's up to him, in other words, to judge whether his gift is the equivalent of the one that he recently received, whether he's giving generously or whether he's being kind of miserly in his return or his counter gift. Now, because you're partners for life, though, there's both on the one hand social pressure to give an equivalent gift. So not from the individual who's receiving it, but from the community as a whole. You want to be seen as someone who understands, adheres to, and respects the codes around exchange. And uh, as somebody who will give appropriately, properly, within that milieu of exchange. But further, there's an incentive to give as good as you have received. Why? Because your partner is going to give you a counter gift in the future that will be judged equivalent to whatever you give this time. So if you're miserly this time, you can expect a miserly gift in return in the future. So that you, you have to, again, be able to sort of cast your thinking into the future and, and think about uh, what sort of glory you want to draw to yourself in the future. And one of the ways that you're able to secure that is by giving generously. The seeming paradox is that among Trobriand Islanders, to possess is to give. And the greater your wealth, the greater is your obligation to share. Malinowski says, Thus the main symptom of being powerful is to be wealthy, and of wealth is to be generous. Meanness, or miserliness, indeed, is the most despised vice, and the only thing about which the natives have strong moral views, while generosity is the essence of goodness. So you can see then, there, there is this social pressure to be generous, quite uh, distinct from the pressure you might put on yourself, sort of calculating what you want to get in the future. And so uh, if you want to be seen as a good member of a community, as, as a good guy, then you'll give generously because that is how you establish your status as this as this good fellow. We can see here then how the real gains and losses of the Kula are social, not economic, but social, especially with, with respect to status. So then a partner who develops a reputation for being a generous gift giver will attract more Kula partners and will see a corresponding elevation of his status. And you can imagine that somebody comes back uh, from a, a Kula expedition and has dozens of items because he's, he's got all of these exchange partners because his reputation as an exchange partner is so good. He's a generous guy. Then he's got all of these items to talk about, to tell stories about, to uh, attract the attention and the awe and respect of the members of your community. This is something that is going to buoy your status within the community. But that's not to say that the economic benefit is completely absent from these expeditions. Secondary trade, so the, the Kula is the primary trade. The secondary trade is very active alongside the Kula, especially in distant islands uh, that don't have the same natural resources as you have. So then Kula sailors will take with them things that are relatively unique to the Air Island and return with things that they don't have in their own islands. And uh, so the, again, the economic motivation here is, I think, fairly, fairly clear, even though in and of itself, this economic exchange is not adequate to form the kinds of networks of exchange and alliance that the Kula does. So it's tempting to think that the Kula is just a pretext for what is clearly economic exchange. Malinowski resists this idea and says it's simply not the view of the participants. 
So he says, the thing that we have to do as ethnographers is remain attentive to what the participants themselves perceive about the social institution in which they're engaging. And for the Trobriand Islanders, he says, the economic stuff is, is nice, that you, you get to bring back these, these lovely things with you, but it's not really the point. The real point is to engage in the kula. That's where all the glory is. That's where the excitement is. That's what people talk about, get excited about. That's what gets people motivated to uh, give their time and energy to creating these fantastic canoes and so forth. So then if you're going to um, take what Trobriand Islanders say about the Kula seriously, and he thinks that you have to, then the economic exchange is strictly secondary. That, in other words, without the Kula, the economic exchange simply wouldn't happen. Pe people would not sail across these vast expanses just for the economic motives. That they do this for the Kula, and the economic exchange is just a tag along. In some degree, then, this is visible in the magic rites and mythology surrounding the Kula. So Malinowski isolates three kinds of magical rites. There are those done over the canoe while they're building the canoes to make it swift, steady, safe, and lucky in the Kula. There are those performed to ward off danger during the voyages. As I said, they're sailing across vast expanses of ocean. So that's intrinsically dangerous. And then third, there are those concerning the Kula itself, directed at making the exchange partner soft, eager to give <clears throat> Kula gifts. So there's something uh, sort of curious here, right? That the your, your Kula partner is someone to whom you're allied, you're committed, you will play host gladly when this partner appears on your shores. And you will be warmly received and housed and fed by your partner when you go there. And yet you also sort of want your partner to give you a better deal than, than you're prepared to give in exchange. You, you still want to come out of this ahead in a way. You, so you want your partner to feel soft, not to be a hard bargainer, but to, to give more lavishly than, uh, than you have to so that you return back with these fantastic items. Uh, and that this is what the uh, magic rituals are organized around um, generating the, this set of circumstances. So then, anyway, so, so then there's some element, not exactly of competition as you would have in economics, but of a, a kind of desire for magical forces to manipulate your trading partner to, uh, to, to be overly generous with you. So then he goes on. He notes further that the Kula is enveloped in legends and myths recounting ancestors' heroic deeds and use of magic knowledge to overcome challenge and conquer enemies. Ultimately then, Malinowski comes to focus on the Kula community which is a village or a collection of villages on an island, say, or in a region of an island, who all go together overseas on the Kula, who act um, as a body, he says, in the Kula transaction, perform their magic in common, have common leaders, have the same outer and inner social sphere within which they exchange their values, va valuables, excuse me. So then they form this kind of compact that goes uh, almost as a unit, you could say, to engage in the overseas Kula exchange. The Kula has, therefore, multiple levels. There's Kula that occurs on the local level that will be much more common, where so that it happens, uh, if you think of it on the metaphor of water, it will be this constant trickle. Right, that, that you have among your villagers and among the, the nearby villages, so that it's this constant but sort of low flow kind of thing that happens. Compared to the overseas trips, the other level, that will be much larger in scale, but happen much less frequently. 
Uh, so sort of a gush of water all at once rather than the local trickle. In either case, though, what do we see? We see that the school is an essential way of binding communities and individuals between communities in alliances and networks. The picture that we wind up with at the end then, and this is what I was driving at toward the beginning, is on the ethnographic plane that Malinowski was, uh, was describing in his introduction, we see Malinowski, the ethnographer, giving this comprehensive view to say, this is what's entailed by the Kula. And indeed, he spends the rest of this fairly hefty book going through uh, the rest of the dimensions of the, uh, the, the Kula from building the canoes and creating the necklaces and bracelets and so on. Uh, so we can see the, the ethnographer's broad overview, the overview that it is uh, not the preoccupation of any of the participants to attain. And through that, what he, um, what he interprets about the Kula is that it has a function that is latent within the whole exchange that is not part of the description that any individual um, informant or interlocutor gives him about the Kula. And so when he comes to this, as I say, Durkheimian perspective about function, he says, well, so the function of the Kula is not to move these different material items back and forth across these vast expanses of oceans, it is to generate social networks, social alliances and obligations between these groups of people that would never otherwise have any intrinsic sense of um, sentiment or loyalty or warmth toward one another, but that you get this sort of inclusiveness, of attachment, of a feeling of um, not necessarily belonging with one another, but a sense of enduring alliance with one another. So then this would be the kind of Durkheimian functionalist insight that Malinowski brings to the Kula. This recognition that it's doing more than its participants say that it's doing. Okay, so that brings us to the end of functionalism. Next, we move on to structuralism. Thank you.